Hello, all my beautiful Cinnabar moths or any kind of moth you'd like to be. Today, I am super excited. I'm talking about one of my favorite topics in the whole wide world. Libraries! Yes, it's finally here, the library episode. <laughs> I don't know why I'm like, yes, it's finally here. I keep meaning to talk about libraries and it keeps getting bumped for other topics because I try and make it topical based on like what people are asking me about and like what people, what authors or the general public has asked me about. And that sometimes changes things. And it doesn't seem like people have asked me about libraries a lot, but I, I want to talk about them. So I'm going to, cause I love them. So libraries are awesome for three reasons. One, they provide access for people who may not have money to buy books or may not have access to internet. They provide internet and books and those sorts of things for people who can't afford to buy them. Two, and this is something I think doesn't get talked about a lot, but CW talked about in her interview, is that CW and a lot of other people, sorry CW if you feel like I'm, I'm singling you out, it just really resonated me with with me when you talked about going to libraries and checking out a book to determine whether or not you wanted to have it in your home as part of your personal collection, that really spoke to me because in Japan, what I will bring into my home is super limited because we have very limited space and we have very limited bookshelf space because we have the length of one wall for our bookcases and it's the length of one wall and the height of about half the wall because there's a, a window on that wall and those are all the books that we keep in our house and we have to recycle them and then at the cinnabar moth offices we have room for a lot more books but those spaces on those shelves i really earmarked as spaces for books we love, but more so for books we publish. Um, and I hope to fill up the space. I want to be two and three deep because we're using tatami closets, which are very deep closets because they're made for a folded up tatami bed, which is half the size of a futon mattress in the U.S. If you have a futon couch that folds out into a bed and you cut that in half, that's the average size of a futon in Japan and those beds are meant to be rolled up and put in the closet. So having that space and reimagining it made me really think about libraries and how much I do depend on libraries for the books that I read. And for, so I go through different moods. Like there are moods and phases where I want to have a physical copy of a book to hold and read and then there are moods and phases where I want an e-copy of a book and I want to download it and have it on my tablet and I want to read on my tablet and then there are moods where I want an audiobook because I just feel like kicking back chilling and listening to a book and I want all of those needs met <laughs> every single one of them and I think it's really cool that you can get every, you can borrow every single one of those from the library at least here in japan you can and i know for a fact in the u.s you can uh check out audiobooks and you can also um at some libraries not all check out ebooks and i think that's cool and the reason i know that is because some libraries have access to our ebook and um i think that's really cool that you can check out check out ebooks so for me, deciding on whether or not I want to buy a book is basically, do I want to reread it? And in what form do I want to experience it? And a library lets you date a book without having to marry it. <laughs> it doesn't have to be your forever book. And I think that that's really cool. And we sell our books at a discounted rate to libraries because we want to do everything we can to support libraries. And um, help them have access to them. And that includes school libraries. And so for me, 
libraries are an integral part of our marketing plan. And if you publish adult YA or middle grade or even children's books or pictures books, any kind of book you publish, including erotica, if you can get that into a library, that's exposure to that book. And that, and this goes for erotica too. Um, if, uh, if it's in a university's library, in their catalog, then that allows professors to determine whether or not they want to teach a course on that book. And to show you that a, a university course can be taught on anything, I know a professor that taught a entire course on Buffy the Vampire Slayer and still does to this day and thinks it's an important, really important to American culture and has all of these reasons and things why they teach on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And I've never seen a single episode, but for them, it was a deeply important part of their life. I think the same thing can happen with books. I know that with one of our books, it actually got picked up um, as part of the curriculum and as part of the required reading for a university book. And that was really exciting. And that's because it was in the university's library catalog. And that made the professor interested in it. And the professor listened to it um, on their way to and from work for a couple of days. And they were able to listen to the book and get through it. And they were like, yeah, we want to add this to the curriculum. So for me, if that, if I know for a fact, if that book hadn't been in that catalog, that that professor in particular would have probably never heard of it and would not have signed it for their class. And if you're looking at um, YA and younger, think about the power of the school librarian, right? When it comes to determining what teachers have access to and because a school librarian makes the school catalog. And I know this because I used to volunteer at our son's library and I was really, which is just like a lucky happenstance, like being a page in the library when I was 12. I just love libraries. And as a, I didn't know I was going to be a publisher. Never being a publisher was absolutely not on my radar 15, 16 years ago. Now, I guess it'd be like 18 years ago now. It was definitely not on my radar 18 years ago when I was volunteering with, uh, at my son's school and it was at his elementary school in the library and the librarian and I became really good friends. And she was like, Hey, look at this catalog with me. And what books do you think we should include and exclude? Because the library only has so much physical space in it. Right. And there are some books that don't age as well as they should. And times change. And there are some books that just aren't as popular and aren't getting checked out. And that's how the librarian makes their decision on which books to pull and which books to put on the shelf, which books to have physical copies of versus which books to have on the suggested reading list where it's not in the library, but they suggest you go and buy it kind of thing. And that whole process was really interesting to me. And now from the publishing side of it, it makes me realize that, wow, that librarian really sets the tone for reading for every single English teacher at the school. And it was the same when I was volunteering at the high school. I would volunteer at the elementary, the junior high, and the high school library because I didn't enough volunteer every day. And so I would just rotate through them. And all of them had their own processes and their own reasoning. And I found that really interesting talking with different librarians and also talking with them about their conferences and being the, the guest librarian at the time. Like I would take over and run the library for them when they would go to conferences and they have different conferences for different age groups. And then they have whole school conferences and they have national local and at these conferences the libraries talk to each other about which which books are resonating with their students and resonating with their teachers and which books they're shelving which books they're pulling off of their shelves and which books they're only offering at the catalog and all of that process was really 
exciting to me, getting into it and understanding it. And even if I don't agree with how a librarian is doing things, it might pique my curiosity and I might want to check out a book. And for me, as a librarian, I would want to see if it's in my local library and I would know I could request it. And that's what the librarian would do. Um, she said, you know, hey, I came back from a conference and everyone's buzzing about this book and this series and I'm curious about it, but my local library doesn't have it. So I requested the series and they're going to order it for me and put it on hold. And she came back and was like, that's a big no for me. But she went to another library to check it out. And it may have been a yes, you know. So I think that that's super duper important. And I think that libraries are super duper important in the process of selling books. And having like a really weird sense of deja vu. If I've talked about this topic before, just know I'm serious about being passionate about it because I don't run through the list. I just talk about, I just get on the mic and I talk about what I want to talk about because, you know, I have to talk for 30 minutes <laughs> and I want it to be interesting. And I think if I'm interested, it makes it more interesting, if that makes sense. So that's one of the ways that libraries sell books. And another way that libraries sell books is through awards. There are a lot of awards that if your book is not in a library, the award won't even consider you. And they don't say that on the awards thing, which I was tripped out about. Like, why wouldn't you say that? Why would you let somebody, like, pay your fee? That feels so wrong and dirty to me. Like, you're letting them pay the entry fee, but you know one of the things you're going to do to check, and I'm doing air quotes, the credibility of their book and the literary merit of their book is to see if they're in libraries. I feel like that should be up front because if I'm not in libraries, why should I pay you 200 bucks to apply for your award if as soon as you can't find me in a library call, in a library catalog, you're not going to consider my book? Yo, like, tell me that right away. Don't let me spend my hard-earned coin on this. And I think that is so unfair. And I think that's such an unfair metric for, like, what is a viable literary book? Are you kidding me? And that, to me, goes into part of the problem of publishing and part of the problem of awards is that the system is rigged. Like, Scholastic... Come on now. And penguins, come on now. You can't compete with their um, library accessibility and contacts if you're a small press or an independent press. And we're really super, super fortunate to have our books in libraries as an independent press. It's not an easy thing to do. And one of the reasons why we're able to do that is because since July of uh, 2020, all of our books have a U.S. Congre Congress the U.S. Library of Congress number, which puts them in all of the catalogs that go out to all of the libraries. And plus, we send them a physical copy of the book. So there's a physical copy um, in the U.S. Library of Congress. Don't know if it's on the shelf, but know that they have it and it might just be sitting in storage. I know that we send them copies. I don't know what they do with them. But that puts us on the radar of librarians and having that, and it's really tricky, really tricky to get. We were super, super lucky that not my ruckus, librarians ate it up. They absolutely loved not my ruckus. And I was surprised because around the office, we nicknamed that book, the trauma book. And on my personal account, when friends say that they bought my husband's book, I tell them, you can go ahead and yell at him if you need to. <laughs> because there's like, seriously, because even our beautiful narrator, Ivy, was like, I had to take a break. I was so mad at Chad. I was like, why are, Why did you do that? And everybody has those spots in the book where they're like, why, Chad, why, kind of thing. But the librarians really ate that book up. And it's stocked in libraries around the world. And... Um, 
that was surprising to me because in countries that I don't think of as non-English, that I think of as non-English speaking, it's really popular in those libraries and in, in the English book section. So that is, that's the book that we sort of rode the wave on and was able to get into the Library of Congress with was based on that book's distribution and libraries. And here's the catch 22 of it. That book can never have a Library of Congress number because you have to get the Library of Congress number before the book is published. And that breaks my heart because without that book, we couldn't get a Library of Congress um, number. So that means that that book, because it's in libraries, it got invited to some awards, which we're very happy. Thank you for the invitation. But there are other awards that go strictly based off of the U.S. Library of Congress. And I'm not, I'm not naming awards because I don't do the name and shame. I think everyone should tell their own stories. And I, it's not written anywhere. This is what I know from talking to people who are on committees for these awards. And to name these awards, I feel like will put my connections in jeopardy with these people. So I just want to say clearly, I'm not going to name who I got the information from. Don't DM me. Don't send a message. I'm never, ever naming. One, because that these people, several people, are friends of mine. And if I name one person, that's a violation of our friendship. They told me this in confidence when I told them I was going to do this podcast and talk about this topic specifically. They said, I'm cool with that. Don't name our award and don't name me. And I'm like, right on. I can totally follow both of those rules. So how do you get your name? How do you get your book in libraries if you're self-published or if you're a small press? And I say, call up everyone you know that lives in a different city than you and have them go get a library card at their local library. And when they get their library card, request your book. Because when they request your book, the library is honor bound to get that book for them. And so it may be that they're only able to get the audio book because that's a different price for libraries than having a physical book, or they may only get the ebook, but no matter what form your book is in, it will be in that library's catalog. And then once you hit whatever number the Library of Congress is putting out this year, because the number changes every year, you can go onto the U.S. Library of Congress homepage and they'll tell you how many libraries you have to be in. But people you know that live in a different state, use your network and put out on Twitter, hey, if can you please request my book? Because there's nothing dirty in asking people to request your book at a library. You can't do it yourself. Because if you get caught doing that yourself, you'll be banned. So seriously, do not go around to different cities. Do not call up different cities. Make sure that the person requesting the book, one, has a library card from the library they're requesting the book from, and two, is not you. They can be your spouse, they can be your child, they can be related to you, they can be a friend, they can be another publisher. And that again ties back into a few months back I talked about collaboration. You can reach out to everybody who works at a different press and say, hey, if you do this for our books, we'll do this for your books. And it's not a big deal. And then check it out once you request it. That's the other part of it. You have to check it out. You can't just request it and not check it out because the library, the librarian keeps track of who's requesting books and whether or not they check the books out and you have to return it on time. So it's a multi-step process. One, you have to have a library card for that library. Two, you have to check the library out. I mean, the book out. I mean, two, you have to request it. Then three, you have to check it out. Then four, you have to return it on time. Because then you're a good library patron and every library, everybody with the library card, they have a rating at their library, whether you know it or not, on whether or not you're a good card holder and what standing your library card's in. And so for us at our local library, I haven't used my card in um, a year or two. I live in Japan and their um, English speaking section is really small. Most of the books in that section I donated to the library. And 
I'll be honest, since starting the press, I haven't practiced my Japanese at all, which means I haven't been to the library probably in over a year, probably a few years. Because, yeah, longer than that, because it was pre-COVID was the last time I went to the library. And people will ask me when I suggest books for their, their kids here in Japan, is that in the library? Can I find that in a library? And I'll tell them yay or nay um, in terms of our local library, not the one I know really well. But getting the, so that's libraries in the United States. Um, libraries outside of the United States, libraries in Australia and Canada tend to really favor books by Australian and Canadian authors, the same in the UK. The rest of the world seems to not have that bias. But if you can get in libraries in Australia, which we've been fortunate enough to get Mount Myrakis into libraries in Australia, it does a lot. Australia does a lot to support their library system and promote and give awards to books in their system. So Australia is definitely one to bite the bullet, fill out the form and request that they carry your book. For a lot of libraries, you can go to that country's website for their national library system and apply to have your book put in the system. And I would say it is so worth it. It's so nerve wracking. At least when I did it, it was super nerve wracking for me, but it's just paid off such great dividends. And I'm just so, so happy with it because there are so many book awards out there. And I think for me, as an American, I was really focused on getting awards from American um, publishing awards that are based in the United States. And when I pulled back and and opened my view and expanded my, my worldview to... So I was looking at our awards given to English language books in Japan. And there are awards given to books written in English um, in Japan, which I was surprised to find... And I was like, this is cool. Didn't know about this. And there are English language books award and book awards in almost every country. And I was really surprised by that because I, I was like, huh, I wonder if there's books for other languages. And I found out for most languages, most countries have an award for that. And looking at those award processes, because I was looking at submitting our books for awards and doing the math. And you could literally blow a million dollars on just award fees, on just application fees for awards. Some awards to apply for them are over two grand to enter. I was like, what? <laughs> I feel like, mm, mm, mm. Because you can find out like what it did for you know, 12 years, five years, six years, 10 years, by just going back and looking at what book won this award 10 years ago. And did they get $2,000 worth of stuff for winning? And I was like, no, they did not. From my perspective, I didn't see, there were some of the books that like the award, nothing came of it. Like the book, you wouldn't even know that it was an award winning book. And when your book wins an award, if it's a prestigious award, you have to reprint your book to put the, to, and have the cover redone to put that award seal on it if you want to, if it's going to be a seller. Like if you're doing children's books and picture books and you win a Caldecart, a Caldecart award, you know you got to put that seal on it, right? So looking at, at book awards and looking at what you get, I look at, value added like does the award have a seal and if it has a seal can I put that seal somewhere and some of the other high-end book awards do trophies and I was like huh do I want trophies like no I want increased visibility and so if it comes with a trophy but no promotion I'm less inclined to put one of our books forward for that. What I look at in terms of the awards that I put our books forward for is what are the what are the requirements? And looking at the people that I know that sit on boards and sit on governing boards for libraries and our librarians and all of those types of things, bringing it back to libraries, 
I talked to them about it and being able to talk to a librarian and say, what do you think about this award is priceless for me. I seriously, I'm just so honored and humbled and grateful to my friends that are librarians. And I asked them, is this something that if you knew the book won this award, that would make you more inclined to read it and more inclined to stock it in your library? And I was surprised at like going down this list. I had a list of like a hundred awards that I was asking about. Bless you and thank you. <laughs> that person who went the went through it with me. And they were like whittled it down from a hundred awards to three. And I was just like, Wow. Really? Just three? And no, I'm not gonna say which three, because this was just one person's opinion. I then did a list of 20 and sent that out because I only did the list of 100 with a good friend that I knew would like tolerate that kind of those kinds of shenanigans from me. But the other list, I pared it down to 20 and I found out that nobody picked the same, but they all picked about five. So from the list of 100, it whittled down to be about 15 awards that looking across the spectrum of all the librarians I talked to. And I think that that's a benefit if you're a publisher. I think as publishers, a lot of people are afraid to promote themselves. And, you know, y'all know I believe a closed mouth don't get fed and I'm hungry. I am shameless. The worst thing that can happen is somebody tells me no. And that no is to me is so worth the risk of the yes. And going to a librarian and saying, hey, can I talk to you about the books that you stock? And do you have time for me to talk to you? I'm, And, you know, introduce yourself and say who you are. And they might say yes and they might say no. And I found that for me, I'm more successful if I've been a good card holder. Like if I go to the library a lot, if they see my face a lot and they get to know me, then that librarian is more likely when it's dead and they're sitting there like sure I'll talk to you about books and enjoy the conversation and so I encourage every author and I encourage every press to get to know your local librarian and get to know the ecosystem of your local library and go and kick back in your library for a day I absolutely love our local library and I love that they have quiet rooms that you can rent and go sit in and they also have which I think is really cool they have movie rooms so you can check out at least in our libraries I don't know what the library system is like in the U.S. with regards to movies but our, at our local library you can check out movies and that's super fun to go sit in the movie room and have like a private theater experience <laughs> it's just me staying alone in that room that very comfy room watching a movie which you know I haven't done in a while but is like a mini vacation and and loads of fun and that doing those types of things where you partake everything that the library has to offer and like really walking through your library and looking at what is on the shelves and kind of interacting at least for me I interact with why this book and I've seen books I love on the shelf, which I'm really excited about. And I've seen books I hate on the shelf. And I think, I hate this book. Why is this? What is this book doing here? It doesn't belong here. Um, and it's really rare. And it's usually an old book that's considered a classic that I don't think is a classic. I have certain authors that are like on my banned list. I don't like seeing their books anywhere. And um, I don't think any of them are. There's a few that are living. A couple that are living. If you want to know who, just scroll through our Twitter feed and you'll see who I like and who I don't like and why. But I don't feel the need to put them on blast on the cast because I'm not about spreading hate. I'm about spreading inclusivity and diversity and welcoming everybody to the party. And I think that's what libraries are about. Libraries are about diversity, inclusivity, and welcoming everybody to the party. They're open to everyone in the public. And everyone who has an address that they can use. And I think some places don't require an address. I do think that I do know, at least when I was living in the United States, that if you were homeless, you could use um, a homeless shelter's address as your 
home address. I don't know if that's still the case. So for me, that was a lot of inclusivity that the homeless population and reading and um, access to Wi-Fi and literature is something that we don't talk enough about. I know in Japan, you do have to have an address. I don't know if you can use a shelter's address or not. But for me, I feel like it's more inclusive than bookstores, than having to be able to pay for the price of a book. And books are expensive. So yeah, that was my love letters to libraries and the benefits of being in a library and how libraries sell, how libraries sell books. I have a speech impediment. I really do. So I say, I know I say library, libraries, libraries. <laughs> Anyways, I hope the, I hope all of our beautiful Cinnabar moths enjoyed this week's uh, the Writer's Triangle is talking about libraries. If I say it really carefully, I can say them correctly. And you can be any kind of moth you want to be. And like I say every week, you can even be a butterfly. But I'm not Mariah Carey and I'm not trying to bite her thing. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. <laughs>